Um, so first of all, uh, th this is more or less the same thing that uh, Annette was also sharing, changes in muscle tone and what could uh, be the cause of those changes. Um, so this is sort of uh, the way that I see things at least, that we have something which is called spasticity, which I think we would all agree because this is in all the textbooks, that it is velocity dependent increase in resistance to passive stretch of muscle. Uh, so it's a, basically a reflex activation of muscle, which is hyperactive. Uh, this is in various uh, forms, the definition that you would find in, in uh, uh, several different uh, relations. So Lance has provided one which uh, is very often being used. Now, we, we have other changes in uh, muscle tone also. There, there's definitely something called dystonia, uh, which is static or dynamic change in muscle tone, which we normally see as a part of uh, basal ganglia disorders. We definitely also see it in cerebral palsy. We have uh, various syndromes where we do see these changes in uh, muscle tone, uh, which we would then call dystonia. Uh, now, classically, uh, spasticity and dystonia, and also kind of related to that, the rigidity, are relatively easy to distinguish because it all lies in the velocity dependency, where the resistance that you feel, the catch that you feel when you do a passive manipulation of the limb, is manifested as this velocity-dependent increase in uh, muscle resistance. What I'm going to argue, and this is also what uh, Jakob is going to argue as part of his talk, is that this is not all that easy to distinguish in many cases. There are quite a lot of cases where we think we can say whether it is dystonia or whether it's spasticity, but it is actually not all that easy. Contractures, I think we all, from a clinical point of view, would agree that when we have clear contractures, it's pretty easy to distinguish from the velocity-dependent uh, increased uh, muscle resistance. Again, the problem is that although we have these clear-cut cases where we have clear reflex-dependent uh, increased muscle tone or we have clearly contractures, changes in the passive uh, properties of the muscle. There are again probably the majority of cases where it's difficult to really say whether it's one or the other. So we end up being a little bit uncertain whether it's now one or the other. Spasms uh, are usually also related to the spasticity syndrome in, in general. It is caused by some sensory stimulus, some kind of stimulus. It could also be coming from a filled bladder which causes a relatively long-lasting muscle activity, but it's definitely caused by some kind of uh, uh, sensory stimulus. And that's what distinguishes it from dystonia, distinguishes it from uh, spasticity. Inability to relax then, uh, which is just a broad term. Uh, I think uh, Annette called it perceptual problems, which definitely occur in a traumatic brain injured uh, patients. Um, I, I've decided just to call it inability to relax because this is something that we encounter quite often uh, in the clinic uh, that subjects are just not able to relax appropriately. And it is difficult for us, especially if we cannot communicate with the patient, to determine why they cannot relax. Uh, and it, especially becomes difficult to distinguish this inability to relax from all the other symptoms because there is an increased muscle resistance as compared to what we would normally see. It might fluctuate with time of the day, etc., season even, but what is causing it? It could simply be anxiety, it could be that it's a bit cold, it could be that the lights are not sufficiently dim, or it could be a lot of other things. Uh, but it becomes a problem simply because the subject doesn't relax appropriately. How do we make them relax? That's not easy. So I think the problem that I'm then um, going to present to you is that um, even though I think we can all agree that there are these uh, different uh, symptoms and, and disorders, uh, I think from probably 
a question of convenience and also realizing the problems actually in distinguishing these, uh, it is my claim that these are merged into one term, spasticity in the clinic. Uh, at least that is what I see when we get uh, patients, uh, because we, we, we want to do experiments in subjects with spasticity, so we can contact a neurologist and we ask for a patient with spasticity. Then we get a patient who has no reflex excitability, but who has contractures, or we get a patient who has dystonia, or we get a patient who is just simply not able to relax. All of it is very clearly, in my mind, lumped into just one uh, big group called spasticity without actually distinguishing between these uh, different symptoms. Uh, and I think I'm not too far off uh, because there was a conference some years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, in which an international consortium of spasticity researchers uh, agreed that it would be a good idea to actually lump all of these two, all, all of these symptoms into one category and call it spasticity, or they call it the spasm uh, uh, consortium, uh, which actually ar argues that it would be a good idea to just realize that this is the way that things are being used in the clinic, so why not just call all of it spasticity? Now, I have a huge problem with this, uh, and I, I think this is an absolutely wrong way of doing things. I think we need to be better at distinguishing these different symptoms because many of them require different treatment. If it was just an academic thing, and it's, it would just be me as a basic researcher uh, sitting here and yelling at all of you clinicians that you're doing things wrong, you have to do as I tell you to. Uh, then I would accept that you ignore me completely, and, and I think you should. But the problem is, I really think it has a fundamental significance for the treatment that you end up uh, giving. Uh, if we have spasticity, the implementation is that this is a disorder of reflex mechanism, so therefore we can give treatment which interferes with the reflex mechanisms. I will discuss later whether that's sensible or not. I don't think it's sensible, but that's another discussion. We can depress the reflexes, maybe by different kinds of physical therapy, but especially to, through antispastic treatment. That makes sense. Antispastic treatment has absolutely no effect on contractures, so of course if we know that it is contractures, it's fine. Then we won't give antispastic medication. The problem is that very often we cannot distinguish the changes in the passive properties of the muscle from the active properties. So when it is not full-fledged contractures, which it is quite often, so there are studies now which demonstrate that already after two weeks, stroke patients develop changes in the passive properties in their muscles, even though there are no clinical signs of contractures but actually most of their muscle resistance at that point are not really caused by reflex mechanisms, it's rather passive changes in the muscle. And this is, as Jakob is going to show, difficult to distinguish clinically. We need some kind of measurement to help us distinguishing this because antispastic treatment will only make the patient drowsy, will have no effect on the problem that they have in their muscle.